Luke chapter number 5, and notice verse number 4. We'll begin reading right there. Now when he, Jesus, had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have told all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came, and they filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. When they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. What a miracle! What a miracle that the Lord could take a servant with weak faith and a weary body and a broken net and sinking ships and still get a multitude of fish. When you see something like that, Brother Phil, all you can do is step back and say, Brother, that's God. That's not man. That's not the governor or the government. That's not the president. Amen. That's just God. That's not even these professional fishermen. That's just God because everything, everything was against the situation. What a miracle. And what I'm really interested in tonight is found in verse number 6 where it said at the end of the verse, and their net break. I want to preach tonight on a broken net. I've been studying this year on broken things and broken people in the Bible. Our society, Brother Doug, they don't think much of broken things. Something breaks, we get rid of it, we get something new. We, we we're spoiled, we've got the means to do it. And uh, here recently, we our, our, our washing machine was leaking. Well, you know what I did? I got my phone out and I got on Google and I'm looking for a new washing machine, seeing how much money it's going to cost me. You know what my wife did? She got on Google and she figured out what the problem was. She took the washing machine apart. She ordered the part. She put it back together. And now for more than a month, now that washing machine's been running just fine with no leaks and saved me about five or $600. Hallelujah. I was ready to just toss it aside. Amen. I commend my wife for having that kind, being that kind of a person. We tend to just throw things away. People don't. People sneer at the idea of eating leftovers. There ain't nothing wrong with leftovers. Right. Amen. I, I found sometimes some things are better the second time around. <laughs> but you know, as I study the Word of God and the life of Christ and His dealings with people, He delights in brokenness. Yeah. Matter of fact, He really can't use you, and He really can't even bless you real good until you do get broken. Right. And I'm glad God can take the brokenness in our lives and he can, he can take the broken things in our life and He can use them to get glory unto Himself. I want us to back up to verse number 1. Notice several things by way of introduction before I get into the main part of the message. In verse number 1, I see the people here in our text. It said, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon Him, Two things I get from that verse right there. The first is this. If you make much of Jesus in your church, in your life, in your singing, in your preaching, people will come. Amen. People, people want to be around Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus. And bro, if you just make much about Jesus and y'all do that around here, amen, people will want to come and get in on what God is doing. Now you give me singers that are just full of themselves and they're all about their talent and how good they are, people get sick of that after a while. 
It may draw a crowd for a little while, but eventually they'll get tired of the arrogancy and the pride. You have a preacher that all he is is interested in talking about how great he is or how smart he is or if he's the hero of all his own stories. People will get sick and tired of that real quick. But you make much of Jesus and people will say, I, I want to be around that crowd right there. Amen. I know there's a crowd out here that says, just preach Jesus, just preach Jesus. And Brother Jordan, what they mean by that is don't talk about sin and don't talk about judgment and wrath. Well, the fact is, if you really do preach Jesus, those things are going to come up from time to time. But we do need to make much of Jesus. But there, there's a second thing I, I see right there. It said they pressed upon Him. People that love Jesus... They want to get close to Him. They want to get as close as they can. Could I say this tonight? I, I get real nervous when I go into a church and everybody wants to sit as far back as they can. Now I'm going to let some of you off the hook. Now whether the Holy Ghost does or not, that's between you and Him. I get some people have purposes for sitting in the back. Uh, sometimes uh, somebody may be doing a security Taking care of that. I appreciate that. Amen. You never know what kind of crazy looney tunes going to come through them doors. Amen. Some people have health issues and they need to be in the back. I get that. Some people sit in the back simply because the front's full, which is the case here tonight. Hallelujah. I was at a church in Arkansas a couple years ago, and normally if I'm by myself when my family's not traveling with me, I'm going to sit front row, piano side, right in the corner. And that week, every, every, every pew, every seat was filled up. I got up, I said, I don't like y'all's church. Y'all took my seat. <laughs> I was joking, of course. It's a, that's a blessing. It's a blessing tonight that these front rows are filled up. That's the way it ought to be. I tell you what makes me nervous is that crowd that used to sit up front and they used to amen the preaching and they used to worship with the singers but then they got mad about something the preacher hurt their feelings or they did something and it got overlooked and they didn't get a pat on the back and so the next thing you know they're moving further and further back and they're getting more and more quiet I'm going to tell you from the back row it ain't much of a step out the back door but people that like Jesus they want to get up close but I, I see the purpose of this gathering in verse 1, the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. They weren't looking to be entertained. They weren't looking for a concert. They weren't looking for a carnival. They weren't looking for a handout. They were looking to hear the word of God. And here, brother and sister, you got the word preaching the word. And they're pressing upon him you know you can still build a church on preaching matter of fact it's the only thing you're going to build a church on amen thank God for good singing and good music God's blessed you all with talent around here and I thank God for that but you know what singing comes and goes music comes and goes Our Sunday school programs come and go I'm going to tell you what if you build amen the church upon the preaching and teaching of the word of God it'll last don't buy into this gimmick thing. Amen. Amen. Where people go off to seminars and conferences and they say, you ought to try this and you ought to just, just preach the Word of God. It, it, it'll, draw, it'll draw the right crowd. You may not have the biggest crowd, but you'll have the right crowd. We see the place in verse number 1. It said, He stood by the lake of Gennesaret also known as the Sea of Galilee, sometimes referred to as the Sea of Tiberias. But more important than that, in verse number 2, I see the provision that was made. It said, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Now keep in mind, the people are pressing upon him, probably to the point they're about to push him right off into the water. And so you know what? Here's the provision. Here's two ships that aren't being used. The fishermen are done with them for the evening. They're washing their nets, and so he's going to get into these ships to continue his preaching. I'm glad tonight that God will provide us with just what we need when we need it in his time and amen. You know, it's always good to wait on God's time. And when we get ahead of God and try to make things happen ourselves, we just make a mess of things. 
Man, Brother Jordan, we cut up this week. He, he, you know, he was telling me the verse, you know, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. He said, I can't find nothing. I'll tell you something, brother. You'd be, be you'd be better off to wait and get the right one than get ahead of God and get the wrong one and have a train wreck of a life ahead of you. Amen. Wait on God. I've seen preachers get envious of other churches that, that have grown and built new buildings and all of a sudden they want to build a big new building that they don't even need and then they're in over their heads in debt and all they talk about from then on, we got to get this thing paid off. got to get this thing. And people get discouraged. Just wait on God and His time and He'll provide you with what you need. He's faithful to do that. But then notice the pulpit in verse 3. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Our Lord did not need a fancy tabernacle. He didn't need a big fancy pulpit and nothing wrong with nice church auditoriums, nothing wrong with nice pulpits, but the Lord was more interested in helping people by giving them the Word than He was what the atmosphere was, what the building was like, what the pulpit was like. He was just looking for any way that He could get the Word to the people. I get real nervous with young preachers that are like, boy, I'm ready to preach. I'm fired up, ready to preach, but man, no preachers are calling me. They won't, they won't give me their pulpit. Did you hear what Brother Cody said the other night? Cut his teeth preaching at nursing homes and jails. And I realize in the age of COVID that may not be as likely to happen in a lot of places. There's still plenty of street corners. Amen. If you really got preach in you, you ain't waiting for a preacher to call, amen. You'll go find somewhere and you'll find some people and you'll find some way to get the word out to them. Amen. Now in verse number 4, our Lord turns His attention from the multitude. and He's going to give a lesson to these few disciples right here, and a lesson I believe we could all glean from here tonight. Notice three things and I'm done. In verse 4, I see the Savior's command. He said in verse number 4, Now when He had left speaking, He said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. I want to say tonight about the Savior's command here, it was progressive. In verse number 3, you remember, he said, thrust out a little from the land. Now in verse number 4, he tells them, let's launch out into the deep. And then he goes a little further and says, let down your nets. That thrust out a little from the land, that's how it all begins. That's how the Lord deals in our lives. Come on, just get into the water a little bit. Step into the water. Y'all remember that old cathedral song? Step into... Somebody need to step in. You ain't even stepped in yet. You need to step in. And then he says, let's thrust out into the deep. Amen. Wait out a little bit deeper. And there comes a time after you've been in the shallow end for a while, the Lord says, come on out into the deep part. It'll be okay. And we, we got a lot of believers today. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven. But you've been hanging out in the shallow end way too long. I know we all got to spend a little time there. But there comes a point where you got to take your little rubber ducky waders off. Amen. And venture out into the deep end. And it's okay because God's out there. And He's going to take care of you. Then He says, let down your nets. Could, could I say it like this? That thrust out a little from the land. That speaks of salvation. You got to get in. Launch out into the deep speaks of sanctification. Where we spend time really getting to know God and know His Word and we mature in our walk with God and in our knowledge of Him. We get a close relationship with Him. Paul said this, that I may know Him. Paul said that after he had been saved a long time. He said, I still want to get to know Him even more. And by the way, church, the more I get to know Him and the more I learn about Him, the more I love Him and the more I find out just how sweet He really is. Let down your nets, that speaks of service. After you're saved and after you've grown in the Lord, there comes a time when you need to begin laboring for the Lord. Serving the Lord, serving in your church, doing the work of God. It was a progressive command, but then it was also a peculiar command. 
It's peculiar because these professional fishermen, they know this, that most fish are caught at night time. And they're also caught in the more shallow water. And here it is, daytime, and the Lord says, let's go out and do some fishing, boys. And let's go out to the deep part. Now wait, now you know they had to be thinking, now Lord, come on, we're professionals here. You're a carpenter. And you're going to tell us how to do our job after we've been doing it all night? It was peculiar. You know, the Lord will sometimes ask some peculiar things of us as His children, things that just make absolutely no sense. You know what He's trying to do for these disciples? You know what He's trying to do for us tonight? He's trying to get us to quit thinking in the realm of the natural and the normal because you know what? We've seen for too long what happens when we go with the natural and the normal. It creates dead Christians. It creates dead churches. It creates dead revival meetings. Amen. But you give me somebody that has some supernatural faith in a supernatural God and what He can do and the power of His Word if you'll just trust Him and step out on faith even when it doesn't make sense even when it goes against what everybody says when it goes against what religion says you just do it anyway and you see what God can do peculiar Our home church is Calvary Baptist Church in Campbell, Missouri. You say, where's Campbell, Missouri? You, ain't, you can't even get there from here. <laughs> God's blessed us with a great church there. Great pastor. He's been there for 18 years. And two weeks ago Sunday, he resigned. And thankfully, Brother Foster, under good terms, my pastor has a heart for missions. And he's particularly got a heart for Egypt. And so him and his wife are leaving their two youngins behind. I don't know how old they are, maybe 20, 22. Uh, they're, they're grown, but they're still single. And they're leaving those youngins behind here in the States, and they're going to the land of Egypt to take the gospel. And, and, and they're, they're, they're willing to step out by faith, and at the same time, they're, they're struggling. 18 years at one church in one little community. And there's some lasting relationships there. And so I know there's some fear on their part too. And he texted me yesterday, asked me how the meeting was going here, told him about the soul saved and just the good spirit of revival. And he said, man, we had a great resurrection Sunday too. He said, the only problem is they got a pastor that's leaving them. And, and you know, you can tell there's some frustration. Just peculiar. I mean, he's not really a young man, 47, 48 years old, and uh, but willing to step out and do the will of God, even though it may seem peculiar. Are you willing to do what seems to be peculiar? To be obedient to God and in the will of God? A lot of times the things that He asks of us will not make sense. But we just step out by faith and trust Him. It was progressive, it was peculiar, but it was possible. As peculiar as it may have seemed, it's possible. You say, how do you know? Because Jesus created the water. Jesus created the fish. Jesus created Peter and the other disciples. Jesus created the ships. And Jesus created that net. And therefore, it's possible. You just got to remember who's in control and in charge of this thing. The Savior's command number two tonight. I see Simon Peter's complaint. Look at verse 5. Y'all must be praying. I haven't, I haven't spit this cough drop out yet. Nor have I choked on it yet. So we're doing okay. Y'all keep praying. <laughs> Verse 5, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have told all the night. We see his objection here. He talks about his fatigue. We've told all the night. Man, these boys are tired. I mean, the Bible said... In verse number 2, that they're washing their nets. They're wore out. They've been at it all night. They're ready to go lay down and get some rest. And Peter says, we've told all the night. We're tired. And then he said this in verse 5, and have taken nothing. 
Not only does he object because of his fatigue, but because of their failure. Lord, we're tired, and we have nothing to show for it. We have failed. And you're asking us to go back out when it doesn't even make sense at the time of day? It doesn't make sense the water you want us to go out to? Lord, I, I object to this. In other words, Peter's thinking, why should I try again when I already tried and I failed? But now you've got to understand, Jesus is in the boat. And when Jesus is in the boat, that makes all the difference. You know what? Maybe you taught a Sunday school class and you feel like you failed. You know what you need to do? Just get some more Jesus in it and get up and try again. Maybe you preach the message and you feel like you laid an egg. You feel like it was a dud. You know what you do? Just get prayed up, studied up, get some Jesus on the message and get up and go at it again. Maybe you feel like you got up and sang and you feel like it flopped. You feel like it did nothing. But you know what you do? Get some Jesus in it. Amen. And get up and sing again for the glory of God. His objection, but now to his credit, I do see his obedience. He voices his objection. We have told all the night and have taken nothing, but he didn't stop there. He said, nevertheless, at thy word, Nevertheless, at thy word. You know what I see right there? His respect for the Lord. Brother Bobby's tired. He's weary. He feels like a failure. But he has enough respect for the Lord. He says, nevertheless, at thy word. Are you tired tonight? Do you feel like you've made a failure of things? Well, at least at his word will you try again. I see his respect for the Lord, but I also see that his obedience was partial. Look at it, end of verse 5. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And the Lord's command in verse number was 4, let down your nets. And Peter says, I will let down the net. You know, it's important to pay attention to the details when the Lord tells you something. It's real important that you pay attention to the details. And, and, and Brother Doug, we could give Peter a hard time right here, and all the writers and commentators do, and I get it. I'm going to cut Peter a little slack tonight. Normally, you know what we would preach? Partial obedience is disobedience. If you got up here and preached that, I would amen you. But could I go another direction tonight and say that partial obedience is better than no obedience? Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. He didn't do it exactly the way God told him to do it. But he did let down a net. I want to have a little grace on somebody tonight. A lot of times as evangelists and pastors, we preach to you and, and we plead with you. As Brother Cody preached the other night, I surrender all, give it all. You know why we do that? Because we know that's where the richest blessings are. When you surrender all, you submit it all, you give it all. But tonight, could I just plead with you? Will you at least throw a net out? Maybe you've sat here all this week and like, I just don't feel like I can give it all. Well, will you at least throw a net out? Can you at least do that? Maybe you're weak, maybe you're weary, and you just don't feel like you got the strength to give it all. Hey, at least throw a net out and see what God can do with that net. Simon Peter's complaint. And thirdly and lastly tonight, I want us to look at the successful catch. Look at it in verse 6. And when... They had this done. Now take note of that word, when. Because everything that follows is dependent on that word, when. See, brother and sister, the when of our agreement is followed by the then of God's abundance. But there's got to be a when before there's a then. Notice it in verse number 6, the slew of fish they caught. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Not one fish, not two fish. Multitude. 
multitude of fishes. It's not the right time of evening. Not the right part of the water. The disciples ain't even got full faith. But they had enough faith to put a net out. And the Bible says that they caught a great multitude of fishes. But notice the stress that's on the net. It said in verse number 6, and their net break. I bet about that time, Peter was wishing <laughs> he had a full he obeyed. He's probably sitting there like, oh man. Why didn't I throw them all out there? And the Lord's thinking, yeah, Peter, you should have but I'm still going to show you what I can do with that little bit of faith, with that little bit of obedience, and even with a broken net. The Bible said their net break. And by the way, every commentator I read says, now that doesn't mean the net actually break. It just means it started to break. Because if it had actually broken, then they wouldn't have got the fish, obviously. Won't you leave the book alone? Why don't you quit messing with the miracles of Christ? You believe what you want to believe, but I'm just going to believe what the Word of God says. If it says the net break, I have no problem believing that it completely shattered to pieces, and yet they still got the fish in the boat because Jesus is in the boat, Jesus is in charge, and He'll get the job done every time whether the net breaks or not. Quit, quit making light of the miracles of Jesus. Tell you what that is, that's no faith. Peter had more faith than most of these self-professing Bible scholars. It brought stress upon the net to the point that the net break. But in verse 7, I see there was support from others. Notice at verse 7, And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And here's the miracle. You want to talk about miracles? And they came. They needed help. And they sought for help from others and they came and they joined in. That's a miracle right there. That you could get two believers, amen, to actually help one another. Hey, God's doing a miracle over here. We need some help, boys. Tell you what, most independent, fundamental, premillennial, judgmental, temperamental Baptists would do. I ain't helping them. I don't even know where they went to Bible college. I don't even know who they fellowship and rub shoulders with. I don't like how they do church. I don't like how they worship over there. I don't care. If it, why don't you just get over yourself and get in on what God's doing? Amen. You say, well, it ain't my boat. Let them have it to themselves. I ain't, I'm not getting in on that. Because you want, you want all the glory. You want all the glory for yourself. You want all the blessings for yourself. Won't you go help somebody and you can at least get in on the blessing? Amen. Maybe God's blessing somebody in, in this church real good and you're thinking, well, I, they don't deserve a blessing. Why don't God bless me like that? Well, can you just rejoice that at least He's in the neighborhood? Hallelujah, at least he's in the neighborhood. It might not be long before he comes to your door, to your house. He's in the neighborhood. Get in on what God's doing. Listen, I, I understand tonight that when it comes to fellowship, there's some things we need to agree on. But I'm going to tell you, man, independent Baptists, some of, we're independent of each other. We're independent of God half the time, I think. Most of the things that we're falling out over and not fellowshipping over just silly things. Listen, I do not care what you believe about Christmas trees. Whether they're right or wrong, I don't care. I do not care whether you have canned music in your church or you don't have canned music. I do not care. Do what works for you. I do not care what you believe about the gap theory. And most of you don't even know what that is. Glory to God. All I know is a lot of people have a gap between their ears. Amen. I do not care. I'm not falling out with you over those kind of things. 
Now some of you are looking at me, well, what do you believe about that stuff, Brother Daniel? Amen. I'm an evangelist. I believe what y'all believe. <laughs> Amen. <coughs> Hey, you ought to know what you believe. Have those things nailed down, but can't you have a little grace with somebody to the point that you can come and support them even if they don't do it 100% exactly like you do it? Just get in on the blessing. Support. We, we could get a whole lot more done for the work of God if we weren't so eat up with envy and jealousy if we would just see God's doing something over there I want to get in on that I want to be a part of that Doesn't matter. it's not about me getting the glory it's not about me getting the attention I just want to get in on what God's doing and these fellows did support from others but then we see the sinking ships verse 7 middle of the verse and they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink now you know you have caught a mess of fish when the ships, plural, are sinking. You got a mess of fish on board. And they got them on the ships with a broken net. That's God, y'all. <laughs> That's not the professional fishermen. This goes against everything they're taught. But Jesus is in the boat. Would you look at Peter's statement in verse number 8? When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Tell you what God can do with our brokenness. our weak faith our weary bodies and our broken nets he'll step in and still do something great and miraculous and when he does all we'll be able to do is fall down at his feet and say I'm not worthy I'm not worthy to even be in your presence I tell you that person that's never had a tragedy never had a heartache never had a problem it's just always been smooth sailing for them that person they'll see something great happen and they'll take the credit for it they'll talk about how wonderful they are and how accomplished they are and how good they are but that person that's been broken that person that's been brought to the end of themselves they'll see God do something with that brokenness and they'll give God all the glory all the praise all the honor because they know it's not them it's all about him and all glory to him now I get real nervous I get real nervous when testimonies break out I like I like a good testimony service brother Doug it seems like there's always that one person that just wants to stand up and it's not about what Jesus has done not about how good God's been. It's, well, you know, I've been serving the Lord now all these many years, and I've just been faithful through the trials, and I've just done this, and I'm, and man, all of a sudden, it's like the Holy Ghost is gone. I mean, it goes from testimony to testimony real quick. See, that person, they don't know anything about a broken net. All they know about is their ability and their accomplishments. And they want to make sure everybody else knows what they've done and their accomplishments. You know what a testimony that brags on the Lord does? It draws attention to Him and it causes us to praise God, to praise Him with you. I get real nervous about that kind of stuff. I get real nervous when I go to meetings and all preachers want to talk about is who's qualified and who's disqualified. 1 Timothy chapter 3 does lay out the qualifications of a bishop. And you know what those are for? Those are for your man of God, Brother Doug Foster, and men like him that hold that office to go through there and strive to live according to those qualifications. I'll tell you what they're not for. They're not for us to go out here around the country and try to see who we can disqualify. Don't you just have enough faith to leave that to the Lord? 
and have faith if he thinks somebody shouldn't be in the ministry he'll take them out <laughs> we've talked about men this week hopefully in a prayerful attitude I hope my heart's right brother Doug that I, I can't go preach for them but what they do is between them and God amen I'm just saying that kind of talk that makes me real nervous because I know what I am I know the parts of me that you don't. And God knows the parts of me that sometimes I don't even know. And the fact that He would fool with me, the fact He'd let me travel around and do what we get to do, I just want to fall at His feet and say, I'm not worthy, Lord. But thank you. I glorify your name. <laughs> There might be somebody here tonight. Maybe you've been through a divorce. And somebody's made you feel like you're some kind of a second-class citizen. I got good news for you. There are no railroad tracks in heaven tonight. Amen. And I encourage you tonight, maybe you've got a broken net. Just throw it out there. See what God can do with it. Sunday school teacher, just keep throwing that net out there and see what God can do with it. Maybe you're here tonight and you've kind of backed up on your Bible reading. Maybe it's been a long time since you actually opened your Bible other than at church. And you're frustrated. Could I encourage you tomorrow? Will you at least get up and maybe read a verse? Well, that's not much. It's better than nothing. Will you throw a net out? Maybe your prayer life has grown kind of weak. Could you get up in the morning and talk to the Lord for a minute? Just throw a net out there? Maybe the last time you got up and sang, it just seemed like nothing happened, and you feel frustrated. Will you get up and just throw a net out and try again? Just a net. And see what the Lord can take and do with that little net. Even that weak faith, can you at least muster up enough faith and enough energy to throw a net out? And just watch what God will do with it. But notice their submission in verse 11. When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed Him. Now there's that, I give it all. You know what will happen? If you'll just throw a net out there and watch the miracles God can do with your little net, your broken net, there will come a point where you'll be ready just to get back all in. And Lord, you can have all my nets. Whatever you want, Lord, I'll give it all. But until you get to that point, church, will you, will you at least throw out a net? Don't quit. We need you. You may feel like you don't have much to offer here tonight. I'm telling you, we need you in the work of God. Emmanuel Baptist Church needs you. Will you at least throw out a net? Just see what God will do with it. Our sister's coming to the piano tonight. Just trying to encourage you. Maybe, maybe you're just not at that place where you feel like I, could, I give it all. Will you say, will you say I surrender some? I, I'll surrender a net. We, we at least do that. But don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.